Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are studying together in the Epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse. Uh, we have been for several weeks. Uh, we're in the second chapter. Uh, we are quickly approaching the end of the second chapter. And I want to just somewhat do a little bit of, try to do a little bit of a review of what we've seen so far as we've traveled through these amazing uh, two chapters of Philippians. You know, these videos, they don't get a lot of views. And the reason, I believe, one of the primary reasons for that is it's the 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 verse-by-verse -verse truth that's taught through these epistles, not just Philippians, but through uh, all the rest of the other epistles. Uh, the ministry which focuses on this dispensation of grace that we're living is seldom taught from the pulpit. And so... It's almost as if we speak a different language. If you if you went to just almost any church uh, nowadays, the question I would like to, to, to pose right up front here uh, to you all is are the question that I would ask is are you being uh, the the, the first thing that you ought to hear taught, the first thing that, got, that should come out of that pastor's mouth when he begins his sermon, and I don't care what, on what topic he's, he's preaching on, I don't care on, I don't, it doesn't matter what book he's studying through, it doesn't matter you know, whether it's verse by verse, expository verse by verse. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, topical sermons. It doesn't matter what he's teaching you on. The first thing that you ought to hear him say to those listening is, is that we grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. Very first thing. Yes, I do believe that part of that which fills up that his sufferings, Christ's sufferings, we, we partake of his sufferings, we share in the same sufferings, we fill up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Yes, I do believe that it includes our relationship with the world religious system which persecutes Christ. It did before the cross and it did after and the amazing thing about it is that it did that after the cross it did that through the person the very person of this of the author the human author of this epistle paul why jesus said to paul why are you persecuting me his body the church no one could have been set forth presented as a better example of our walk in christ than paul no one could be presented as a better learner okay from having with the background that he had as as we've seen with Paul's uh, his history uh, as far as his relationship to that religious system, that Judaistic system, that system of law. 
and human merit. And it's why he persecuted the church. No one could be presented, I don't believe, in any better light than an individual suffering for the sake of Christ. He's where? He's in prison here in this epistle. And the important thing, I think, to realize is that God put him there. Now, folks, I don't know what you... I don't, I don't know how that you would set about going about explaining the fact that God himself took someone like Paul and put him in prison. And that as a result of that, of his being bound to the gospel, a slave of Jesus Christ, bound to Christ, a, a slave of Jesus Christ, a slave of grace, not a slave of law, but a slave of grace. He could not have preached anything other than what he preached. And I don't I believe the same is true of, of you and I. A lot of people come out of law into grace, but very few people go back from grace to law. And I just think the very first thing that you ought to hear taught every Sunday from every church across the land, from every pulpit, is that we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and yet that is not what you hear taught today. We've seen that the Holy Spirit is the author here. It's not Paul, that we're not looking at Paul's feelings. Not, it's not that we're discounting his feelings toward the Philippians. It's not that Paul didn't love the Philippians, but we see that God loves us that God has the same feelings toward us as Paul did toward the Philippians. And if you miss seeing that, you've missed seeing a lot. If right at the beginning of this epistle, if you miss see seeing the fact that we have are given grace and uh, an introduction, a greeting of grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're missing a lot. If you miss right it from the very beginning that we're called saints. Now, how, does, how, how do people interpret that? It's, well, I'm called a saint. Okay, so I guess God is referring to me as a saint. But he's only talking about when I'm being good. Or he's only talking about, he, don't even, he only means that in the sense that I act like a saint. And folks, you know as well as me that we don't always act like a saint. We don't always walk worthy of our calling. We've been called saints. We've been called through the word. God spoke to us through his word. He called us. He separated us from that world system. And, and with looking at everything that Paul went through, for him to be confident that, that God would would the one who be began a good work in us would complete it until the day of, of Christ Jesus goes contrary to much of, mo of what modern Christianity thinks and teaches today. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, will complete it. There's no question about it. You know, you can argue all day long with your friends about you know, the, the doctrine of eternal security, or once saved, always saved. Folks, we have one verse among many which says God will complete the work that He began in you. That's in you. That's in your sloppy life. That's in your life. Your messed up life. He will begin, with the work He began, He'll finish. He's the author and the finisher of our, of our faith. And if you are telling me that you hear this taught across the land from every pulpit in the United States and beyond and abroad, then I don't know what world you're living in because that's not the world that I live in. We see Paul's feelings toward the Philippians, but we, so, but we see God's feelings toward us. These are God's feelings toward us. It's not just Paul's feelings toward the Philippians. We, we're clearly shown who Paul was, where his, what his background was, where he came from, what he came out of, into. We're, we're shown that just as clear as day, and yet we don't see that as a, 
as a stark wake-up call to not live according to that world system based on human merit. He was, he was in prison. He was a prisoner of the Lord. He was a bond slave. He was a bond slave to the gospel. He was a bond slave to the faith, the faith, that faith that we're to once and for all contend. We contend for that one faith. It's, the, it's articulated. It is the faith. It's not our faith in Christ. It is the faith of the gospel that God is faithful. God is faithful. Are you hearing preachers tell you from the pulpit Sunday after Sunday, God is faithful in your life? Are you hearing that? Probably not. And yet, he is said to be a prototype of all those who would hereafter believe that includes you and me. And everyone who, fought, who comes... Uh, behind us everyone he was the prototype he was the example and we see christ suffering for our sake and we, and we see how that we are to be sub, submit ourselves in the same way that the christ submitted himself to the father submitted himself to death we are to conform our lives in, in such a way doctrinally that we submit ourselves to this God who loves us so much and has poured out so much grace in our lives. That's what God is asking us to do. And it, and it, and it almost brings me to tears, dearly beloved, that so many Christians don't care about that. When you have a God who's pleading you, with you, who's through the Holy Spirit pleading with you verse after verse, chapter after chapter, epistle after epistle, to come and submit yourselves to the God of all grace. I think many Christians, more Christians would if it was taught, but it's not. It's not taught today. They've, they've departed from the faith. Modern Christianity as a whole has departed from the faith. That is a fact. Because the entire emphasis is on you. It's not on Christ. It's on your performance, human merit, what you've got to do to either get yourself, yourself saved or to keep yourself saved. The emphasis is entirely on you and on human responsibility with very little said, very little mentioned, very little mention of the sovereignty of God in our lives, that He is sovereign, that He's directing our lives, that He directs our steps, that He's laid out our path. That when he's testing us, we shall come forth as gold. There, the comfort is not coming from the pulpit. Okay? It's coming from this book. Therefore, the pulp, pulpits in, in the main are not teaching the truth of this book. Dearly beloved, I have dedicated my time, my energy, my resources, my love, everything about everything. I have dedicated that to the ministry of grace, this, ministry, this particular ministry of, of grace. And I did that, why? Because I'm such a, a, a great person. I'm, try, I'm such a tremendous, I'm an exceptional ind individual here. There's few like me. Uh, of course, and I, and I hope you realize I'm being sarcastic. Folks, it has nothing to do with us. The most messed up, mixed up, confused child of God can teach that we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, how I want you to see that. So as these uh, videos continue to receive less and less views because I've offended someone's uh, feelings uh, along the way in, in some form or fashion or their sensitivities about the law and how that, you know, uh, I've slaughtered so many sacred cows, it seems, along the way. I don't have any choice but to continue to look at the text and just and, and teach what the text says. And this, this chair right here is not the final authority. I've told you that. Don't believe something just because I believe it. 
It's I don't it is not this chair that has a handle on the truth. This book, this book is what can be trusted. God, the God of this book can be trusted. The source of all truth is this book, not what comes across through this microphone. And we've seen Paul's, we've seen him, he's told us, the Holy Spirit through Paul has, has clearly told us that how that his trials advance, actually advance the gospel. There is so much comfort in that. I would know. I, I would. I hardly know where to begin. I mean, to, talking about that. We fellowship. We have that in common. We fellowship in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you follow this channel, you know. You know, where I stand on that. That the gospel is not something man must do. The good news is not that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The good news is what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did. Okay? That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's what we preach. And those who have ears to hear will hear. And those who don't will not. That's just, that's just the, the fact of the matter. You know, I've, I remember years ago, you know, people, over the years, people have asked, they have said, they've told me, so, they've said, Steve, well, if, if that's the truth, if what you're saying is the truth and, and, it's, and it's not, the gospel is, is what Christ did, not what we did, why preach the gospel? Why preach it? The, the question almost, I mean, to me, almost seems uh, unnecessary. I mean, the we preach it so that his sheep will hear. How can they hear if there's just no preacher? Okay, and I, and this same author, I can't recall the verse exactly where it's where where it's at, but he, the same author, uh, the Holy Spirit through this same author, declares just as much. Okay, how can they hear without a preacher? The emphasis. I want you to take note, just a casual reading, folks, of the first two chapters and what you will discover is the emphasis is on God's work in us, not just in the past, what he's done, but what he is doing and will do, the emphasis, on, the emphasis is on God's work. It is not on our work at all. Okay? At all. Okay? At all. Yes, there are admonitions. There are uh, exhortations to walk worthy of the calling in which we've been called. There's, we have a responsibility. I'm not trying to toss responsibility out the window. But the emphasis here is on what he's done, and it's based on what he's done, is doing, and will do in our lives that we do. Not the other way around. Not, not if we do X, A, B, C, or X, Y, and Z, then God will do such and such or whatever. Why, folks, is there even any mention of of the need for us to coming into to having an, an experiential knowledge, gnosko in the Greek, not oida, not intellectual knowledge. You know, we are people who already know him, oida, okay? Intellectually, perfect knowledge. We have a perfect knowledge of, of Jesus Christ through this book. But why even mention the need for an experiential knowledge of him if it were law? I mean, try to imagine we're under law. We're not under grace. We're under law. And, and, and alongside the fact that we're under law and we're, we're held to the strict demands of the law, we need an experiential knowledge of Him. doesn't make any sense. The reason why we need an experiential knowledge of Him is because we're not under law, but under grace. We grow in grace and knowledge of Him. And we've, we've seen that it is needful that we be here. It's needful. If we're here, it's because there's a purpose in it. God has us here for a reason. And as much as we long to be with Him, 
We see God, we've seen from this study, we've seen that God longs to be with us. That's every one of us. If you are a child of God, God longs to be with you despite your messed up life. And folks, that ought to bring so much comfort in your life in your in your into your day, you should be leaping for joy. Okay. And dearly beloved, these are the things that sustain us through this life, this thing that we call life, through our journey here. These truths sustain us. They uphold us. They strengthen us. They comfort us. They give us joy and peace. And why wouldn't Christians want this? Why are Christians so adamantly opposed to God's grace? Well, it's, I guess I suppose I, you could say that the, suggest at least that the primary reason for that is that they have the whole entire wrong idea of grace. Grace leads to licentiousness. And folks, that is not true. It is to say that grace leads to sin is, is saying the very opposite of what the book is saying. That we're saved by grace. That grace saves us. That we're saved by grace. We've seen the bond that's between us all. The bond. How can there be a unity? How can there be a bond? How can, how can we have that same, be of the same mind, same spirit, same this, same that, same everything? How can we, how can that be when each one of our lives is so different? We're on different levels of, of maturity. Some have, have just been, they've, they've been only been in, in Christ for a week. Some have been in Christ for 50 years, 70 years. How can that be? How can there be such a bond between the youngest believer, the one who just accepted Christ a minute ago, and the one who's been in the Lord for 60 years? Because the same truths apply to us all. God is not a... He, he's... He's not a respecter of persons. He's, he, he doesn't evaluate, weigh our performance, and then bestow his blessings based upon that performance. Now, what he's done is he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies where that our performance then follows. Okay, It's based on, on, the, on the fact that he has blessed us. Not that he will if, if we somehow managed to dot all our I's and cross all our T's. And we are called here in this chapter to be subject to God's grace. The heart of God is calling out to you to, to commit yourself, to, be, to, to subject yourselves to what? The law? No. His grace. His love and His grace. It's amazing. I want you to feel the heart of God in this passage that his, his longing is for us. His longing, is, his longing, as far as our lives is concerned here, His desire for us, His will for us, which is, has very much to do with our, being, our having been sanctified, set apart for, for service. His will is that we be subject to, to his grace. I can't I can't even imagine a, a a Jesus Christ who would at any moment, at any time, want us to feel afraid, worried, upset, discouraged, confused, you know, uh, feel like a failure because we didn't somehow match up to some expectation either I, some expectation that we thought that he had of us or some expectation that some other person had of us i mean come on seriously this is how we become sincere and without offense this is what we are truly without offense we'll, we stand before god holy unblameable unreprovable in his sight the god has nothing against you or me and yet we're told to be blameless 
as far as our walk, our conduct, our behavior, it is to be blameless, not offending one another, not causing harm to one another, which we do when we take and put our brothers and sisters under law. So it's no wonder the Holy Spirit introduces us to the reality of, of the gospel versus our adversaries and describes clearly and plainly in as, in as simple a language as he can, as he possibly could, just who our adversaries are. They're the same adversaries that Christ encountered. Those who mutilate the grace of God. And we are not those who mutilate the grace of God. We are those of the true circumcision who worship God in spirit and truth and who have no, no, no confidence at all whatsoever in the flesh. Just stand up on Sunday morning and if you're allowed and tell your pastor directly in front of everyone else that, that you have no confidence in the flesh. I don't, I don't know what, maybe they, they, they might ask you, escort you out of the auditorium. Folks, this world is in a mess. And I'm not just talking about the world as in the planet, okay? I mean, you know, we know it's, an, it's, it's in a mess. It's always been in a mess. I'm talking about the ecclesiastical system. Modern Christianity today, folks, is a wreck, okay? It is a train wreck. It is derailed, okay? It has departed from the faith. Yes, yes, it has certain beliefs that are true. It'll tell you, it, much of it will tell you that Jesus is God, that Jesus died on a cross, that he paid for our sins, and, you know, so that we could go to heaven, and on and on and on it goes. There are certain truths that even modern Christianity with all of its legalism cannot deny. Okay? Of course, much, much of these, these verses, they try and twist it to fit their narrative of law and legalism and human performance and human merit. But they do so to their own spiritual ruin. This is what we're told to avoid for ourselves as well as others. God wants us to know that we're his children, that we're his children by birth, by new birth. We are children of promise, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. There is, we have, in just a, one paragraph or in just a handful, a handful of verses, we see packed within, jam-packed within just a handful of verses an enormous amount of doctrinal, positional, theological truth that you won't hear from the pulpit. I don't care how many times you go to church throughout the week. Why is that? Why is it? Another thing that we've seen here is the effects of these truths in, in our lives. How will these, these life-changing truths, how will they affect our lives? And we see that. We see that in the text. We see the res we've seen the results of our not being those who are not delivered. I'm talking about Christians here. I'm talking about children of God. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the results of law in a believer's life where that they are not delivered from guilt. primarily guilt they're not delivered from sin self the law the world satan now ultimately if they are a child of god if you are a child of god if i am a child of god i'll be delivered ultimately my body will be delivered from this corruption but in this life the only thing that will draw us nearer to christ the only thing that will light a spark that, that spark that will that lights a fire underneath us to want to proclaim the truth of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, only grace does that 
Law will never do that. Law cannot do what, what grace does. And it's, it's not unique to this epistle. We are told right here in this, in this study, we've been shown what the nature of true righteousness is. How the nature, the function, the characteristics, the evidence of, of true righteousness. We, we, have, we have seen that, that all righteousness is of the Lord. That it, it's, it comes, it's, it's the righteousness of God. It's not the righteousness of us. And it comes on the basis of faith. It's the righteousness of God based on faith. God reckons righteousness to us when we trust Him. Our trusting, our believing God, righteousness is reckoned to our account. Law can't do that. For me to live is Christ. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed that, I'm not amazed. I'm not, I was, you know, I was going to say, I'm really amazed that those words are in the Bible, that it doesn't amaze me that God would come right out and, and say through Paul, for, for to me to live is Christ. Uh, you know, he didn't say, you know, and and this is what I love about the Holy Spirit, you know, being the author. He, he chooses his words carefully. He chose his words very carefully. He didn't say, for to me to live uh, is trying to be like Christ. We've seen that, that, that belief, both belief as well as suffering, are gifts of God. They're gifts of grace. It is, a, it is God's gift of grace that you believe and suffer for His sake. It's been granted unto you by grace that you believe and suffer. I don't know how you would even associate suffering with law keeping other than, you know, uh, the world who doesn't know God, you know, they're out there throwing rocks at you because you're, you're, you're preaching law. And then, you know, so you, you get hit with one of these rocks and you say, well, I suffered. Well, you may have suffered, but you didn't suffer for the sake of the gospel. And folks, it's the same gospel, same gospel, same faith, same suffering, same love, same spirit, same mind, same affections, same desire, same will, same walk. <laughs> okay, it's the same. Yet you wouldn't know that when you looked around you today. Christians are, are scattered, divided into all sorts of camps, different camps, belief systems. The unity exists. The unity is there. It's not that, well, we need unity, you know, and it's, it's we have unity. And we see that where that unity lies. It's We've seen that our lives, it's, it's about exalting Christ. We exalt Christ. We don't exalt self. We don't exalt, exalt uh, our own abilities, our own talents. The exaltation of Christ. And then the, the thing that, that most Christians hate, it seems that they hate so much, and that is God's sovereignty. Because that seems to increase. In, what, what would be the word? Uh, encroach upon their own freedom of, 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 of will. In every single instance in Scripture that I have looked at any individual who has come to know God, that God has dealt in the life of this individual, or that they are children of God, that God directs their steps, in every single instance, every single one, God, I, I, I don't see any picture ever, nowhere do I ever see any picture of God fighting with that individual over, you know, and with the possibility that, that, that somehow this, the will of the creature is somehow going to override the will of the creator. I never see that. 
I've, in 40 years almost of studying this book, I've never seen it. Some good grace Bible scholars have called, you know, God the hound of heaven. Okay. God knows what he wants and he's going to get what he wants. This is this almost this entire study has been a little different than what we've studied through all these other epistles that we've studied. It's deliverance from law. The focus, the emphasis is on the exaltation of Christ, not self, grace, not law. Deliverance from guilt, sin, fear, worry. And Christians don't want that. Now, I don't know what they want, but they don't want that. And, and the few of you who come here who do, I know that it cannot be, it cannot, cannot, cannot be me, my voice, my personality, my attitude, my expertise, my intellect, my logic, my, it can't be anything that's convincing you that what I'm telling you is the truth. And I praise God for you. You are my joy and my crown, which we're going to see Paul mention later. So no wonder, no wonder in verse 17, and we're going to look at that. We're going to go on down and look at this, uh, the rest of this and try to close out the rest of this chapter. No wonder we read in verse 17, brethren, brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them. Notice, in the, in the Greek, it's observe. Okay, take note. Mark them which walk. That's, that's conduct, that's behavior. On, in, on, in, in the context of the ecclesiastical system. I'm not, we're not looking at the world here. We're looking at brethren. Be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I've told you often. So apparently he's told them this before. And not only told, it, told them this, these things before, but he's told them this, these things often. That there are many who walk. And now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now you would read that and you would naturally assume that, well, what Paul's got to be talking about are those who are not brethren, that they're enemies of the cross. And I'm not so sure that we can limit that just to those who don't know the Lord. Dearly beloved, this is an ecclesiastical, a church context. There are those who are enemies of, not Christ. He didn't say cry, enemies of Christ. He said enemies of the cross of Christ. What did the cross do? It crucified. Those who desire to live under law really don't have much use for the cross as far as that cross has, pertains to their life. The cross of Christ. Few Christians today are even aware of the fact that, that we're, we've been identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. That when, when Jesus Christ died on that cross, we died on that cross with him. Why? Why? I don't know how God could have made a, a more clear statement that self has factors not into this at all. Okay? That law... Human performance, the flesh, doesn't factor into this at all. And there are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, ruin. That can either mean physical ruin, spiritual ruin, eternal ruin, but it is the word is ruin. Whose God is their belly. Of course, that's, you know, uh, right away you want to think, well, they're eating too much. And that's not what that's saying. It's the God, their God is their emotions, their affections, 
their feelings, their appetite, their desire, their will. That's who their God is. Whose glory is in their shame. And what a, what a phrase. Their glory is not, they don't glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. They glory, the only glory they have is in their shame. Who mind earthly things. Who mind earthly things. And folks, if you don't understand that that's talking about the flesh and the law, you haven't spent much time in this book. For our, our conversation, and not a, it probably says conversation in the King James, that, that word is not conversation, it's citizenship. Our citizenship, okay, is in heaven. Now, why does he contra why does he automatically bring in a, a stark contrast between their minding earthly things, which is the flesh and the law and the world system based on human merit, just to say that our citizenship is in the heavens, and that's plural, by the way. It's not in heaven singular. In the heavens. Our citizenship is in the heavens. It is clearly saying that this is not where we are at. If we want to act like, you know, idiots and we want to live by the law, well, we're living according to a system in which of which we don't belong. Because our citizenship is in the heavens. Plural. Now that's a toughie. Okay, if you want to if you want to spend about five or six hours looking at asking, you know, trying to figure out why the Holy Spirit said heaven's not heaven, be my guest. It's a tough, it's a tough one. But I'm going to make a suggestion. The reason it's plurals is so th because the Holy Spirit is trying to get the point across. <coughs> he wants us to realize that this is all encompassing. It's everywhere. The heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. Heavens, plural. From whence also we look for the Savior. The Savior. Notice he, it doesn't say from whence also we look for the Redeemer, our Redeemer. The Savior. The Deliverer. The Deliverer. The Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. And that's, that's not talking about now, you know. Uh, I actually knew a brother many years ago. He was, a, he was really, he really was a homely looking sort of fellow. And he wasn't attractive at all. I mean, he was in every possible way. He was the last person that, that you would think would, would win a beauty contest. And he, he would talk about how that he was looking forward to the Lord changing his vile body. And folks, that's not what it's talking about. We know what that's talking about. That it may be fashioned like under his glorious body. Folks, someday this conflict is going to end. Someday that suffering is going to end. But we don't have to exist in the present confused, worried, upset, afraid, fearful, and feeling guilty, lacking peace and joy. This, this is why I've, I've often... You, I often use the phrase, especially in my correspondence, resting in Him, or I'll say rest in Him. Those three words, rest in Him, have a, an enormous, they carry enormous weight. How do we rest in Him? By growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how the the second chapter ends, even though we know there are no second chapter divisions in the original text. It's according to the working whereby he's able even to subdue, that is, subject all things unto himself. He's able to subject all things unto himself. 
I don't need worry about why someone did not subject themselves to the grace of God. Not my job. God is able. He's faithful. Faithful is he who calls you who also will do it. Look, I'm trying to keep these videos a little shorter. Uh, I think maybe they've gone on too long. That's, that's why many people have not been able to hang with, uh, you know, the last thing that people wanted, Christians want to do today is go back to school. And I understand that. I just hope that as, we've, as, as we continue on, I hope and I pray that you will somehow, through the, uh, the sloppiness of, of, of this teaching, of mine you you'll be able to 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 gain a better grasp of just how amazing these truths are in light of the condition or the state of modern christianity today folks i don't hate modern christianity okay many of my brothers and sisters are trapped within that world religious system and they need to be brought out of that fire, snatched out of the fire. Until next time, rest in Him. Thanks for watching.